So this video ties together the concepts that we've been seeing in chapter 16, where we're looking at hominid evolution and how we eventually end up with modern people when it comes to all of these earlier hominid and hominoid groups that we've been talking about. Uh, the purpose of this video in particular is to talk about how we eventually end up getting to modern people, to Homo sapiens. There are technically seven other members of our genus. So remember, um, Homo sapiens is our two-part scientific name. The genus is Homo, the species name is Sapiens. So anything with the same genus name as us is going to be very, very closely related. I will actually talk about seven of these groups in this video. Uh, the first, well, five of them are, uh, are included in this chart that I took out of your textbook. Uh, so if we start with our, our first group here, if we look at Homo habilis, these guys were the earliest known species of the Homo genus. So if we're looking at the time period where the fossils were found, it's between 2.4 and 1.4 million years ago. Uh, these guys were referred to sometimes as the handyman uh, because they used some primitive stone tools. So it's nothing as sophisticated as the tools we'll see later on, but they were using uh, stone tools that they like flaked off and sort of made like a sharp edge to use it as a basic cutting instrument. Uh, the only other group we're going to talk about are the Australopithecines. Like, that's the whole group of, of genus Australopithecus that comes before the, uh, the Homo group that we're mostly focusing on in this video. When it comes to comparing that group to Homo habilis, Homo habilis has a brain capacity that's about 20% larger. So they're definitely um, a lot more intelligent than the group that came before them, those Australopithecus. Uh, individuals. And again, that one's a genus, just like Homo is a genus. So there's many different groups in Australopithecus. The next one to talk about is Homo ergaster. Uh, this group was uh, evolving within about 500,000 years of Homo habilis. So they're direct um, descendants of individuals from the Homo habilis group. You can actually see that their time span overlaps a little bit. So we go, uh, the earliest point is 1.4 million years ago, whereas these guys are going between 1.8 and 1.2 million years ago. So there is some overlap where both of these different groups were on the planet at the same time. Uh, as far as Homo ergaster goes physically, they had longer legs, shorter arms, and larger brains than individuals from the Homo habilis group. They also used some more sophisticated stone tools, the other thing that's interesting about them is they're the first group that migrates out of Africa and into Asia and possibly Europe. Uh, there's some debate about the fossil evidence that's been found there. But if you remember, when it comes to uh, the migration that took place here, most of these species start in Africa and then move out into other areas. So Homo ergaster is the first group of individuals from the Homo genus to, uh, to leave that African area. Uh, another thing it mentions over here is that they had thinner skulls. Uh, that's one of the things that we notice as we go through and get closer to modern people. The thickness of the skull decreases, and then a more human-like nose where the nostrils are pointing down, whereas some of the groups from Australopithecus, the nostrils kind of flare out, uh, more of like what we see with some other higher-level primates. Uh, the next one is Homo erectus. This is actually the longest-lived group of the Homo genus. So they've actually been a far more successful species than even Homo sapiens. They were on the planet for an extremely long time. You can see here they span from 1.8 million years ago to 400,000 years ago. So they're on the planet for a significant amount of time. They're about as tall as modern people. Uh, their brains enlarge over the course of their development. So this species is on the planet for a long time. Earlier specimens have a brain of about 900 cubic centimeters, whereas the, uh, the final ones have a brain of about 1,100 cubic centimeters, like the ones that are closer to the end of their range, closer to 400,000 years ago. So that's why it says over here the average capacity is around 1,000, but we actually do see their brains getting bigger over the course of the development of this species. Um, so they used fire, and there's some evidence, actually, that they also lived in caves. And you can see this sort of as a theme here, the idea of the thinning skull. The skull's getting thinner and thinner because the, uh, the brain on the inside is expanding and developing. We'll actually see that the skull begins to change shape as well as we move through some of these other individuals. 
uh, the next one is not represented on this graphic from your textbook because there's a little bit of debate about it, but uh, these ones are Homo florensis. The idea with these guys is that we found them on the island of Flores. They're only uh, in existence on this one island, and they're, they're very small. They're referred to as like a hobbit group. Uh, they only grew to be about three feet tall. There were examples, though, of stone tools buried with them, so that shows that they are more intelligent, that they are using some of these tools. Uh, the debate that surrounds them, and probably part of the reason why the textbook didn't include them in this figure, is they're not really sure if it's a new species or just what we would consider an island dwarf. Uh, there's this established scientific principle called the island effect, whereas if you have species uh, living on an island for a long period of time, it tends to make <clears throat> excuse me, um, large species small and then smaller species large. So there are examples of islands where you'll find dwarf elephants but giant rats. And the idea is that there's an ideal size for animals to be if they're living on an island because the island's going to have limited resources. So it can't support huge individuals. So it tends to make human-like species smaller, which is why there's some debate around this one. And uh, scientists are not exactly in agreement as to um, whether Homo florensis is going to be its own category or if it's actually just an offshoot of one of the other groups. Um, the next one, which also isn't included in our figure here, is Homo heidelbergensis. And uh, this one is actually uh, extremely important because this is going to be the transition between Homo ergaster and then modern people. Uh, one of the things that's, that's very interesting is we're not directly descended from the Neanderthals, even though we kind of overlap their range. We'll talk about them a little bit more. Um, the idea is that the uh, species that were descended from are these individuals from Homo heidelbergensis. Uh, the reason for that is because of their bodies. They're a lot more similar to modern people. Uh, they have larger brains, they have thinning bones, and uh, modern people actually have much thinner bones than some of our ancestral species, especially the Neanderthals. The An Neanderthals had very, very thick bones and uh, like a very muscular body plan. So they were a lot different looking than, uh, than modern people. Uh, the other thing about the individuals from Homo heidelbergensis is that they had brow ridges, which are represented in a lot of these pictures. So the brow ridges are this part, like over the eye socket, where the um, like the the brow portion of the forehead is very pronounced. Like the eyebrows almost seem to like stick out. And you'll see in, in modern people that part of the skull actually smooths out because it's making more room in the front for what's called your prefrontal cortex. It's like the front part of your brain. Um, but they also, um, Homo heidelbergensis, had a receding chin line, which made them somewhat unlike um, modern species. So they had that brow ridge and the receding chin, which uh, it's hard to show you with these because most of these skulls are actually missing the lower jaw. Uh, you can only see it here in Neanderthals, but uh, they don't really represent it as well. Uh, the receding chin is basically what we would consider like an underbite almost. Uh, so if you know someone who has that, you can see like their chin almost like tucks in a little bit. Uh, that's how a lot of previous species looked just uh, just normally. Uh, the next one for us to talk about, which fortunately is on this graphic from your book, is Homo uh, neanderthalensis. So Neanderthals with a little ensis on the end, Neanderthalensis. Uh, they evolved in Europe and Asia about 200,000 years ago. Most likely, uh, they came from Homo erectus. So we're seeing how people uh, came from this Homo heidelbergensis group. Neanderthals came from that Homo erectus group that was so successful, that lived on the planet for a very, very long time. Um, the Neanderthals are shorter, but they have a lot more muscle mass, naturally, than, uh, than modern humans do. They also have different muscle insertions in their bones, which indicate to us that they would have been very, very strong, like far stronger than modern humans are. Uh, they do have very thick skulls and that bony brow ridge that we're talking about here in the front. So they're a very robust species. Part of, this, uh, part of the reason for this is they live during an ice age, and their bodies kind of reflect that. I mean, this was a burdensome time for these species to be in existence on the planet. 
There's a lot of fossil evidence of them having like broken bones and arthritis and other issues like that. Um, their skulls were actually very, very large, which you can see in this part of the chart, uh, 1,500 cubic centimeters, so even bigger brains than modern people. Although the thing that's interesting is intelligence isn't all about brain size. It's also about the structure of the brain and the complexity of it. Modern brains are a little bit more complex than the brains that scientists estimate the Neanderthals had. So even though their skulls were quite large, they weren't uh, quite as intelligent as Homo sapiens, as modern species. That's not to say they weren't smart, though. Uh, there's evidence that they cared for their sick, that they buried their dead, that they used fire, and that they uh, maybe even used some kind of basic language. Although that's one that there's uh, sort of some debate about. Uh, the other thing that involves some debate with the Neanderthals is whether or not they interbred with modern people. Uh, we know that they lived in the same range as modern people, and they overlapped for roughly 10,000 years. Um, you can see here, it looks like the overlap is only 5,000 years, but there are uh, like there's like some debate about some of these numbers. Um, so the uh, Neanderthal group went extinct about 200,000 years ago, and uh, we're seeing that this is one of those groups that could have potentially contributed genes to modern people. Uh, part of the debate around this is we have a lot of genetic information in common with the Neanderthals. The question is, did that come from humans and Neanderthals interbreeding, or does that simply come from the fact that we have common ancestry, and therefore common genetics? So the debate still sort of rages on as to uh, whether or not the Neanderthals and modern people actually interbred at any point, and it's something that we probably need more fossil evidence and more genetic evidence in order to really be able to, uh, to figure that out. So I hope that this ties together that statement that I made in the beginning of the year when I talked to you about not liking the sort of bumper sticker approach that we take to evolution where you have maybe four or five individuals in this progression from monkeys to like caveman to modern people. Uh, you can see that that progression should be far longer. It should be a parade, you know, not just this short little line at the grocery store, how it, uh, how it looks on everybody's bumper sticker. Uh, so even just in our own genus, there are many examples, seven different examples of, of species, and these are things that are very, very closely related to modern people. So you can see that we're actually many, many evolutionary points removed from higher level primates like chimpanzees and bonobos. But there's no denying that there is uh, certainly an ancestral lineage between us and then those kinds of higher level primates. So as always, guys, I appreciate you taking the time to watch. Just make sure you answer the questions that are found at the end of the video.